I'm going to leave. There's a clipboard up here this morning. I'm going to hand it to Sandy. It's asking for greeters and lay leaders. Please sign up for one of those. It takes all of us. Oh, I'm sorry. Sandy says there's a second page there for the ladies who are coming to the ladies' event. That's on the 22nd? May. Of May, yes. Sign up for that if you're interested in attending that. You have the announcements in there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading those. I think most of you can read. Uh, just remember, if you're wishing to donate for the Ukraine, there's a, an option there to do it with Samaritan's Purse or any other organization. Are there any announcements that are not in the bulletin? Then I would invite Cheryl to play the prelude and I would invite you to inhale the aroma and the promise of new life. If you're allergic to flowers, don't inhale too long. <laughs>
after your resurrection, you appeared to your disciples. You breathed on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. You gave joy and exaltation to the whole creation. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. After your resurrection, you sent your disciples to teach all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You promised to be with them and us until the end of the world. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. O Christ, through your resurrection, you lifted us up and filled us with rejoicing. Through your salvation, you enrich us with your gifts. Renew our hearts, our lives, and fill our hearts with joy. Through your victory, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. O Christ, you are glorified by angels in heaven and worshipped on earth. On the glorious feast of your resurrection, we pray to you. Hear us, Lord of glory. Save us, O Christ our Lord, in your goodness. Extend your mercy to your people who await the resurrection and have mercy on us. Hear us, Lord of glory. O merciful God, you raised your beloved Son, and in your love you established him as head of your church and ruler of the universe. By your goodness we pray. Hear us, Lord of glory. Amen. Amen. Sally's uh, younger brother, John, had passed away this week, so we'll keep him in our prayers. That family. Anything else? Quiet week, huh? Wow. All right, all right. I bet if we gave you a little more time to think about it, you'd come up with something, but that's all right. Praise God for the warmer weather. I know it snowed today, but let's just kind of like put that out of our mind for a minute. I saw magnolias blooming somewhere. Hopefully this didn't do them in. That is the trouble with magnolias, you know. But anyway, 
There's so much to be thankful for. And I can, as soon as I open that door, I smell these flowers. And I know for some of you, that drives your sinuses crazy. But I don't know, man, it just blesses my heart to smell it every day that we have that here. So praise God. Thank you to those of you that, that ordered those flowers in, in memory and honor of loved ones. And it's just a beautiful thing. All right, let's come before our God in prayer. Because after all, the proof of God's amazing love is this, that he, Christ died for us, and he rose for us, sinners like you and me. And he forgives the broken, and he heals and gives strength to the weak and the wretched and the loner, even the scoundrels among us. Maybe the scoundrel looks you in the mirror in the morning. He forgives you. And he beckons you to come to him in prayer, to have a conversation with him. And so we dare to approach God with confidence this morning, with faith and with penitence. And if we have no faith, do it anyway. We come before him and he hears you. Lord God, forgive us for the stuff that we know we need to do yet. Forgive us for that which we do on purpose when we willfully disobey you or hurt someone when it's become natural to us as a defensive mode. Lord God, we know it's not who you created us to be. You are merciful. You forgive us and you listen to us. We pray, Lord, that you would intervene for us on our behalf for the cares that we've lifted up to you this morning. Lord, we pray for the seemingly little stuff in our lives. A little habit here. A little something there before we know, we know it our lives are overcome Lord God you are merciful and you do care and we thank you that we're forgiven in Jesus Christ's name and so Lord we bring you all honor and praise and glory that's due your name especially on this day this day that we celebrate the resurrection you cause breath to fill our lungs you open our eyes that we can see and our lips to proclaim your merciful name to all the nations. You awaken us this day with the dawn of a new age. And we pray, Lord, that if there is someone here that does not know you, Jesus, yet, that this would be the dawn of a new age for them, a day that the sun will rise afresh. Because it rises on friend and foe alike. And the truth of Christ's redeeming resurrection is ablaze across the heavens. For indeed, Christ is risen, and he brings the fullness of life to all your people. So we give you thanks that in Christ Jesus you, you do reveal to us your word. And just as the prophets listen to your voice, make us likewise attentive to the word that became flesh, and thereby empowered to speak the truth of your love. And we give you thanks that in Christ Jesus you have opened the way for all to approach you in prayer. For as he offered himself as a sacrifice that was pleasing in your sight, we yearn for the day when all that we do will be in praise of your dear name. We confess Christ as the cornerstone of the church. And we give you thanks that even now in Christ Jesus we taste the new wine of the gospel. Already the past is finished and gone. And we gather this day. We gather as a community of witnesses to the meaning of Jesus for all human life. Fill us with the spirit of resurrection as we seek to become your redemptive community. And so we lift up to you our concerns for those that we name on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, we give you thanks that, that a home was found for Dottie's mom. And we pray, Lord, a blessing upon that household and her life within it. Lord God, we lift up to you Scott, who is now has this mass on his kidney that Lord that you would tend to that that you would bring him peace in his life and a calm and a healing and Lord we pray too as whether we what news we catch whether it's Pittsburgh or it's Erie or it's Youngstown we continually hear of yet more shootings more deaths more people being injured homes being torn asunder Loved ones taken too soon from violence in our cities. And Lord, we know that it can happen here too in the countryside and in our small towns. 
Because, Lord, we know that in our small towns and in our countrysides, that the impact of broken homes, the impact of poor decisions, of alcoholism, of drug abuse, that it happens here too. And Lord, that no amount of laws, no, no amount of whether we take all the guns away, people will f still find, Lord, reasons and ways to wreck their lives and others. They'll still find ways to cause injury and death. Lord, we know that the only thing that will change that is the knowledge and the conviction of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray, we pray a holy moving on our cities. And that this Resurrection Sunday would be catching. And that the people of your churches, Lord, would be driven out of the walls of the church to share the good news of the gospel, to change lives, to change the trajectory of families. And Lord, we lift up to you those who protect our communities, our first responders, our policemen. And we wonder, Lord, when we hear the news and we hear of riots and marches, and we wonder why in the world would anyone want to be a policeman today? And yet they do. And they still put their lives on the line for us every day. Wives still send their husbands out to work and don't know if they'll come back at the end of the day. And husbands the same. So, Lord, we pray a special blessing upon them. So much we could pray for today. Lord, we, of course, continue to pray for the Ukraine. And we pray, pray for Russia. And we pray for our own leadership in this nation. That, Lord God, that, that you would take hold of their lives. And you would care, Lord, for the, the homeless. That you would care for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. And you would care for those who huddle in fear in underground tunnels for protection from bombs. Oh. Lord, we pray for the children and the innocents that always seem to be victimized by war. And give you thanks that we have not known it here. May we never take that for granted. For Lord, it was only, it was only a couple of years ago that we weren't allowed to gather in our church together. Only a couple of years ago, we didn't celebrate Easter together as one family. May we never, ever again take this day for granted. And the luxury of a peaceful gathering. Enable us to recognize you with us, alive and active in the world and in your church and in the lives of the women and men who serve you. Come to us now by the familiar path by which your grace is known to us. Minister to our hidden needs and answer our silent prayers. Hear us as we join together in the prayer that you gave, that your son gave this church and his church as we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare for this time of being able to share of our gratitude, our tithes, and our offerings, may we, may we be inspired by some special music I hear that's been prepared for us. So we look forward to um, Cheryl and Sandy's offering as well as the offering is taken up. Gentlemen.
And Cheryl, a special thank you for sitting at the organ today. You know that's a big gift to us. We thank you. So Cheryl, you're on for the next. The doxology, please. Oh, what other doxology? I'm sorry. It's all caught up in the moment. Yeah. Okay, you gave me a compliment, now I'm out. salvation upon our lives and how it's changed forever and lord we lift up you to you with gratitude those new folks that are welcomed into the family due to your salvation and the work of this day and so lord we give out of our gratitude these gifts and we ask lord that you would bless them and you would use them to the glory of your kingdom amen you may be seated I, I, was, I should have asked you all to be praying for a fellow by the name of, of John Masters. And Master, and some of you kn would know his family because they had a farm down here where the lake is at one time. But he's the husband of the choir director at Union Church where I preached earlier this morning. Well, actually, I didn't preach there because they had, they had a cantata. And, well, it was great. The choir did their job. But her husband's in charge of the sound equipment. And, you know, they play the, 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 the canned music that leads us, because we don't have an orchestra and a band and all that, right? But you've heard cantatas where they play the music in the background that accompanies the choir. Well, about two seconds into the song, it quit. And he's in charge. And, and he wasn't paying attention. So we had to stop and start over again. Oh, that doesn't end there. It gets better. He starts it again, and you get this terrible screechy feedback, and we're up there like, you know, in an old Star Trek movie going, <laughs> right? <laughs> this happened three more times. I pity him this afternoon. <laughs> I, I've been in trouble with the choir director before as a member of the choir. I can't imagine going home with her and being in trouble. <laughs> Prayers for John. Well, golly. So I, that, I haven't gotten to preach this sermon yet. Uh, so you all get it for the first time this morning. But you know, those of you who've been coming throughout Let, we've been on this journey through the words and the things that were happening in the upper room. The, the scene would be familiar to most everyone of the Last Supper. Uh, the night when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I know today is Resurrection Sunday. But let us see how this applies and how the things that, God, or that Jesus predicted that night have come true and have been realized for us today. So our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 16 to 24. We'll also read a very familiar reading on Easter Sunday from John as well. Well, let us pray for illumination in the reading and proclamation of God's word. This is indeed the day that you have made, O God, a day of gladness and rejoicing. You cause new life to burst forth with great beauty and fragrance. So may we witness the beauty and take in the fragrance of your word. Amen. Gospel of John, chapter 16, beginning with verse 16. Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and he goes on to say, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not be see me. And again, a little while you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, 
What does he mean by a little while? We, we, we do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing, in, nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We hear all the time about heart health, right? Taking care of our hearts, eating the right stuff, not eating the wrong stuff, exercising, don't smoke, don't drink, on and on and on, right? All this stuff about heart health. But did you know that the most important health concern of all is our spiritual heart health? That's even more important than your physical heart. I, I'm sure, I just wonder if I polled the congregation and if you were honest, my bet is most of us are less than healthy when it comes to our, well, either heart health, right? We all have a little room for improvement. If I ask how much time you, this Lent you spent in prayer, or in time with your Bible, or in worship, or just admiring the Creator's nature and giving Him thanks. If I ask you if you did a little more than what you normally did in Lent, my bet is some, yeah, some of you would say, sure, I did. And some would be like, yeah, do I have to give an answer? Maybe some of us, some of our spiritual hearts need a defibrillator. Even if I asked if during Lent, did you make a decision or did you stick to just spend a little more time doing any one of these things? Have you? I hope that I am unnecessarily pessimistic on the topic. But you know, all we need to do is make a decision to care for our spiritual heart. It's just like when our docs talk to us about our heart health. It's just a decision, right? Jesus is more concerned with your heart than your cardiac health. And a matter of fact, he even tells us that we have control over our heart, heart health. In, way back in John 14, 1, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. You have control over whether you believe or not. You have control over how much you want to believe. It's a decision. You have control over whether you are going to ignore Jesus, worry about it tomorrow, think it's all stupid, or spend time doing other stuff in life until the day comes that your time on earth is cut short. And let me tell you, it's always cut short. There's never a good time to die, is there? Nope. When we choose to believe God, He, in all of His grace, grants us believing hearts greater than we knew we could ever have. And just to be clear, He chooses us, but we must acknowledge Him by believing. John 16, 22, So also you have sorrow now, but I'll see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. You know, as we step further from belief, we will have sorrow. But he'll not let you go, nor forsake you. He will mend your heart and make it all new. But, but, you know, I know that for many of us who do try to spend some time getting our hearts better with God, we sometimes get all caught up in the minor stuff. And it may seem huge to us, but in the big picture, in God's view, I mean, maybe we judge someone unfairly. Maybe we criticize. Maybe, there, maybe there's somebody here today that you're looking at like, eh, I've never seen them in church before. 
Maybe God cares about how we treat one another. Maybe he's concerned about the logs that we ignore in our eyes. When we cause trouble in the church, or we do too much, or whatever it makes, whatever makes us a poor witness, he cares about it. And it all goes to our heart health. We all need to be mindful of our hearts. And it's our choice to show you how this works and how Jesus warns us. And we can, we can look at the upper room discourse. We can see the heart problems with the disciples that they had and, and how Jesus can teach of us through them. So Jesus knew that the disciples were going to come into a time and a season of great sorrow because, as we know, they didn't at the time that he would be crucified and die. And within moments from when he was saying this, he would be betrayed, he would be arrested, and he would be beaten and crucified. Verse 16, a little while and I will leave you, a little while and I will return. And so begins the greatest debate in the church. The big question. The disciples go back and forth about the meaning. And as, as Christians to this day, we go back and forth too. Well, did he mean the, the three days until he was resurrected? Or was he talking about his second coming and the whole, you know, the whole thing about the end of the world and blah, 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 you know? Did, did he mean a little, literal little while, like in a few days? A century or two, or a millennia or two, 2,000 plus years, we're, we're still kind of waiting, right? Is Jesus talking about his return from the tomb or his second coming? The end of this world and the new one to come. End time stuff, what is it? Well, don't get hung up in it. The disciples choose to ignore their hearts in favor of what? Self-reliance, pride, position, that's when they have this big argument about who's going to be at his right hand and who's going to be second in command and on and on and on. Reality is their problem was disbelief. They weren't hearing what Jesus was saying to them. Maybe we're no different. No wonder from the beginning of the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus is so concerned with their hearts. I would discourage you from joining the debate over what Jesus meant by in a little while, and in a little while I'll return, that whole thing. I believe he's speaking mainly of his return from the grave as we celebrate the resurrection this Easter. The disciples were so worried and so confused by the words they couldn't get past it, and they couldn't hear what Jesus was saying, which was pretty important, like he and God are one, hello, right? So I think part of what Jesus is saying here is key, that I'm going away for a short bit. We know three days, right? But I'll return. We know that he died and was raised on the third day. Easter, right? But we also know he ascended into heaven a little bit further down the road. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And we know he promised to return again the second time to make a new heaven and a new earth. And so we're still waiting on that. Okay, got it. But he spends, very little, he spends very little time on this because he's much more concerned about their weak hearts. Guys, keep a healthy heart. Believe in me, believe in the Father, right? Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. Jesus knew. He knew the sorrow that they would experience. I mean, Peter alone, if you know the story about what he went through, Imagine the anguish and how he felt after that roast rooster got done crowing. And for the next three days or so, living with that. Poor guy. Have you ever been through something so awful, so emotionally painful, that you had a, an ugly cry? That's a new term to me. I just heard somebody the other day on TV or YouTube or something, some woman talking about having an ugly cry. I'm pretty sure I know what she means. And it doesn't sound good. I, I, you know, I mean, that, I, I, have, I have suffered sorrow to the point where I hurt to my bones. I've suffered, and some of you, I'll bet you all have been there, a lot of you have been there and done that. Or had such deep grief and sorrow, like when a loved one dies or something, and you got that ball in your throat that hurts to choke down. I mean, what is that? Is that like a muscle spasm or something? I mean, it literally feels like you got something caught in your throat and you just you got to like force it down. 
And that is, ugh, I hate that. That's some seriously bad sorrow, right? Ugh, it's awful. So then, then Jesus refers to this pain like that of childbirth. Okay, that leaves about half of us out in the room, right? We've never had a baby. I've never had a baby. I, I don't have children, so I've never even witnessed it with my wife. But I've had kidney stones twice, and I'm told they're just like it or worse. I really don't want to be in the competition. I wish I didn't know. And I have a sinking feeling I'm going to get to find out again. Ugh. I've never witnessed a baby being born since we don't have children, although I've watched all the Call the Midwife shows, so I have a little bit of a clue, right? <laughs> I don't know. But Jesus uses this, because we all kind of know, if we haven't witnessed it firsthand, if you haven't experienced it, where he says, and verse starts in tw verse 21, you'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman's giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So, also, you have sorrow now, but he promises joy in the future. So in spite of these words from Jesus, they were so caught up in unbelief that they would go on out and they would run away at the first sight of conflict. And Jesus is arrested. They deny knowing Jesus, hide, and they'd hide in their houses in fear. Even the women and the family of Jesus would mourn and disbelieve. Then Jesus ends his promise of sorrow with a promise. I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take the joy from you. And so we come to one of our favorite Easter stories that you just got to hear every Easter, right? John 20. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Does that sound like somebody that believes? They heard what Jesus had been telling them back in the upper room? Anyways, I go on. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb, and both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stopping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Peter, or Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So he goes in, they believe that he's not there. But they don't believe yet in the resurrection. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and she wept. She stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Why are you, who, whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me, where have you laid him? And I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things 
to her. And one would think they would have all believed at that point. But if you'd read further, you'd find out they still didn't believe. They didn't believe the women. The disciples and the women were mourning and they were upset and they were fearful. And just like that, when they heard their name from Jesus, she believed. The others had yet to believe. But immediately, her sorrow was turned to joy. I know some of you can relate to this story. You've had that sorrow and had it replaced by the joy of Jesus Christ. Think about your life in the faith and your life out of the faith and back to belief. I, could, I know people in this sanctuary and I'm not going to call on you now. I would have called, let you know ahead of time if I'd do this to you, but I ain't going to do it. But I know you have stories of those times where you were far away from the Lord and you came back and the joy that filled your heart when you came back to the Lord. Jesus proclaims God's sovereign presence in and governance of the present and the future. And so he's Lord of it all. For those of you who have been with me through this entire series on the Upper Room Discourse, you may remember the sermon on tribulation. The word, you know, tribulation, not a word we use today, but translated into our modern English, it's mama said there'd be days like this. And that's what tribulation is. Bad times, sickness, death, heartbreak. And Jesus assures us we will have tribulation, especially if we're following him. I mean, imagine, imagine if we made the heart choice to lean on Jesus in times of tribulation and trust him for today and for tomorrow. Imagine if we made the choice to believe in Jesus and believe in his, pro his promises. Imagine if our present sorrow could be transformed into a future joy a joy that no one can take away. And I know some of you got those stories. And I know that some of you that are right now mourning the loss of a loved one, a spouse even. For some of you, it's very fresh. But you'll realize a joy, if you have not already, that nobody can take away. I think of even recently, you know, many of us here are very excited and, and supporting and even involved in the coffee shop ministry here in Mercer that we're beginning, and it's been slowly taking a effect. And, and some of you know the story of Denise Orr and how Denise, uh, she was just getting ready to go get training over in Greenville on how to do the coffee shop thing, when walking a path she would walked a bazillion times before, she suddenly falls and like seriously breaks her leg, shatters it like you would in a major car wreck. Just slipping on a path. And she's like the driving vision behind the whole thing, right? Leading the rest of us along the way. And it gets stopped for a year or more. She can't do any physically much with it, except for inspire folks. And you wonder, talk about tribulation. And it's something we all thought God was calling us to do. But what many of us saw as a setback, God used for his glory, and the stories keep coming. And we're not open yet, but you, you've seen if you're following us on Facebook, little bits and pieces, things are coming together. It's taking shape, and before long it will be. But even if, even if it is not God's will that we complete the project and it doesn't happen, he'll have impacted this community. God will have done something. And it's brought a joy to us. And we can take joy in that, knowing that God's got this. The future, the present, and the past. God, by his incredible grace, will turn what we see as darkness in our lives to sorrow. Even if the pain, even the pain of the cross, was turned into a resurrection. A new day full of joy beyond measure. This is our hope as Christians. As believers in Jesus who choose to believe, Christian hope is the conviction grounded in the victory of Jesus' death and resurrection. That, that one's present and future belong to God and that as a result, all things are possible. Verse 24, until now you've asked for nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So today, 
we celebrate the victory that Jesus has won over death and sorrow that comes in this life. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow, right? Favorite old hymn. But it's true. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And I can face tomorrow because Jesus promised to rescue me when I believe in him. And he rescues me when I don't. Come back Pentecost Sunday and we'll talk about the Holy Spirit, what he left behind for us in the meantime that he talks about here in this reading. And it is the Holy Spirit that has made Jesus real to very many of us and to believers for well over 2,000 years. And that's going to continue until he returns again. Friends, I know we have some guests here and family and stuff that are in, and, and I don't know all of you. But if Jesus doesn't feel real to you today, if you have pain in your heart, if you feel disbelief, if you don't trust Jesus, it's all right. If you are in sorrow so bad that you have an ugly cry, or if you're hiding your sorrow and you're all twisted up in pain and hiding it from everybody so nobody can see that how much you are hurting, just cry out to Jesus. It's really that simple. Cry out to Jesus. Ask Jesus to be real to you. Confess to him. I think this is all hockey puck. It's not real. I don't know what these Christians, these people in this church are talking about. I'm only here because grandma made me come. Or mom or whatever, dad, right? Cry out in Jesus' name. Help me believe, Jesus. Or in your ride home, quietly under your breath. Jesus, Jesus. Rescue me from the pain that I'm in. Help me to believe. Jesus, if it's not time yet to be delivered from this pain or this illness or this broken relationship, Jesus, show me the hope. Show me the light at the end of the tunnel. Assure me of the promises that you've made. Help me to know that because you live, I can face the rest of the day, let alone tomorrow. And I pray that we as a church that we continue to get our heart right, that we continue to practice and promote heart health, and that one day, maybe this church, maybe we are already getting to be known this way, but maybe we call ourselves the Cool Spring Heart Fitness Center. That's corny. But you know, our leading physician is Jesus Christ. And he can heal the most broken heart one that no one else can. Friends, reach out to Jesus. He will lift you out of wherever you are. Because he's not on the cross anymore. And he's not in a tomb anymore. He has ascended into heaven. He sits on the right hand of the Father to save you, to lift you up from whatever grave you are in. Because he lives, you can live. Friends, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that in the confusion maybe of the word, and I know you were present in, in my research and in my reading and writing to prepare for this morning, but Lord, what's more important is you are present in the hearts and the ears and the minds of everyone here today and everyone that will hear this message later on, on YouTube or on our Facebook page. Lord, I pray that you will enter into their hearts, into their lives, and revive them if they need reviving. You would clear out maybe some of the pathways that, that your lifeblood courses through in order that we might believe. And that we could choose to believe you and seek to believe you more and more every day. We commit your word and we give you thanks for your son Jesus, whose name we pray Amen. Let's sing together, He Lives, and pray my voice holds out for it. It's about the third time today I've got to sing this, and I can't help but sing it loud and loud and loud. So. I serve our risen 
and you don't understand it, it scares the bejesus out of you. Whatever it is, I would be privileged if you'd call me and I'll walk with you on that faith journey, that beginnings. Or somebody else, if it's grandma that loves Jesus and you know that, and you want to get some of that, talk to grandma. Talk to mom, dad, whoever. A friend at work that knows Jesus. Somebody at school that knows Jesus. Reach out to them. And you know what? You may startle them a little bit. You might scare them because maybe nobody's ever done that to them before. But I'll be praying for them too. And you guys can walk together. 
Friends, join with me in the response of benediction as we close the worship for today. In your bulletin, you'll find the responses are on, are on the screen, I suppose. The victory is yours, Lord Jesus, this Easter day. The victory is ours this Easter day. The victory over sin and death is won by Christ Jesus. Go out and celebrate the risen, victorious Lord Jesus. If you agree, Jesus is risen, say with me and repeat, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter. Mm -hmm.